Many of you know that I had a public debate with Rabbi Tovia Singer last summer here in Nashville. What you may not be aware of is the role that Dr. Michael Brown played in helping me prepare for that debate. Prior to the debate, I had reached out to Dr. Brown out of the blue. We didn't know each other. And he was not only kind enough to get back to me and offer some advice, but he also reviewed my opening statement and gave me feedback and even took time to chat with me in person, one-on-one -on -one, at the Messiah Conference last year in Pennsylvania, where he gave me this book that he wrote on the resurrection, which was a great resource. And after the debate, Dr. Brown even took the time to give me some detailed and super helpful constructive criticism about how I did, the things I did well, the things I could have done better, and his guidance and mentorship really meant a lot to me personally. And I wanted to share that with you up front because it's a reflection of the character and the integrity of Dr. Brown as a man and as a follower of Jesus. He has the heart of a pastor and a teacher and the intellect of a scholar. And I'm excited to welcome him to our Defending the Biblical Roots of Christianity channel. Please welcome Dr. Michael Brown. Hey, great to be with you. And thanks for that hey, gracious, uh, thanks for the gracious introduction. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. You probably don't even realize what a, what a big impact you had on me. Well, thank you. With all your help. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That was a, um, it was an interesting thing because I, as you might know, the, 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 background of this channel, the goal of this channel is really speaking to a lot of times Hebrew roots, um, this idea of how do we follow, what does the Torah really look like in the life of a Christian? And then when, when Rabbi Singer wanted to, to debate, it was a whole other world for me because here was someone that didn't even believe in Jesus. So you, your, your help was greatly appreciated. Um, and so I, I, I kind of mentioned off, off air here that one of the reasons I'm super excited that you're on the show is because I think you have a unique perspective about the role uh, as a Jewish man, as a believer in Jesus, I think, and as uh, the scholar that you are, I think you have a very unique role to speak into what this, what this channel is all about and what our conversation's about. So I wonder if you might uh, begin by giving us just a brief overview of your testimony, how you came to, to find Jesus. And, and I'd be specifically interested to hear a little bit about, like, what, was there any struggle reconciling your faith in Yeshua with your with your Jewish heritage? Sure. The Lord saved me in late 1971. I was at the time 16 years old, heroin shooting, LSD using hippie rock drummer, of course, Jewish, my mom and dad Jewish, bar mitzvah at the age of 13. But I was not raised in a religious Jewish home. Um, we, we would attend rarely any services during the week, uh, you know, Shabbat services. And then at the high holy days, we would, we would go. Uh, sometimes in our synagogue, you didn't, didn't even have 10 men on, on a Saturday morning. You had to scramble to find 10 for the basic prayer quorum. And yet we had to build an annex to seat several hundred people for the, the high holy day services. So that's the Judaism I was raised in. It was really somewhat wishy-washy. For sure, I knew there was them and us. There were Jews right. and then the Protestants, Catholics, Gentiles, Christians. That was all kind of synonymous. There was them and us. But uh, in point of fact, I was not a religious Jew. So uh, the whole counterculture revolution came in the 60s, the whole rock scene. I was playing drums. I got really into it, got really into doing drugs. And that became my identity. I had a capacity to use large amounts of drugs and seemingly come out unscathed. And I was a good drummer. And so that, we were going to be rock stars. And my two best friends, one of them raised Methodist, one Russian Orthodox, but absolutely nominal, no gospel knowledge at all. They liked these two girls. These two girls had an uncle who was a pastor, Pentecostal pastor. Their dad had been praying for them for many years. He got saved after he got married. And the girls started going to the church services. My friends started going. Little by little, God started changing their hearts. I finally went to pull them out, and God started to change my heart. Initially, it was not an intellectual process. It was more the Holy Spirit convicting me of my sin, the things I boasted about one day I now felt ashamed about the next. And, and then just God revealing his love to me after convicting me of my sin, God revealing his love. Somehow I knew that I knew it was real, that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. So I got, I got radically set free, turned around overnight in, in December of 1971. And 
I, I remember as my dad saw the change in my life, because he, he and my mom were concerned. They knew I was doing drugs. They just didn't know how bad it was. Uh, I, my dad said to me, Michael, I'm glad you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. So he, in turn, brought me to meet the local rabbi, which I was very happy to do and, and share the wonderful faith with him. Uh, I knew nothing about Jewish roots of the faith. I knew nothing about the name Yeshua versus Jesus. I knew nothing about all the first disciples being Jews. I just knew that Jesus saved me and this Christian faith was true. Didn't know anything about church history. It was just straight from here back to the Bible. So the rabbi befriended me and one of the first books he gave me was a book about anti-Semitism in church history. So it was kind of shocking to read, but bear in mind, being in a Pentecostal church, it's not like I was a Lutheran and now you're attacking Martin Luther, or I was a Catholic and you're, you're pointing out the Crusades. And it's church history was kind of unrelated to me. So sure. I thought, that's a lot of bad stuff, but what's that got to do with me? I'm a Jesus follower and we go back to the Bible. Ob obviously, you have to answer those questions, but back then, that didn't really affect me. What affected me was the constant challenge, well, you don't even know Hebrew. How can you tell us what to believe? Now, coming to faith, the, the number one obstacle overcome was pride, having to say I was wrong and others are right. And then sure. right behind that, very close to that, was my drug addictions. A distant third was the fact that I was Jewish. But now, being challenged by this rabbi, you don't know Hebrew, he's bringing me to meet other rabbis. And, and now I'm, uh, I'm saved almost two years now. He brings, brings me to meet Lubavitch rabbis in Brooklyn, so Hasidic Jews, ultra-Orthodox who specialize in bringing wayward Jews back to tradition. And, and you know, they're sitting there with their Hebrew Bibles, the little Hebrew I learned from my bar mitzvah. I can't even, I can't even read that anymore. And it was challenging. And it certainly looked more authentic to do what they're doing than to be in a church somewhere. So... This really challenged me, and I knew, okay, I, I'm going to have to learn Hebrew, and I'm going to have to really go to God and study these things, because as much as I know Jesus changed my life, I know these are valid questions that are being raised and valid challenges. Right. And after meeting with them a second time, spending many, many hours together interacting, I got on my face and said, God, I, I want to follow you as a loyal Jew, whatever that means. If it means my faith in Jesus is wrong, then I'll accept it, whatever the consequence. If it means what I believe is right, and it means being rejected by my own community, I'll accept that. I just have to follow you and your truth. And that, of course, ended up strengthening my faith, deepening my faith. And then as I began to dig in and realize, okay, I, I need to be able to just go to the text for myself, not have to rely on what a commentator says, or a rabbi says, or a church leader, or a dictionary got to be able to study this, understand it for myself. The more I dug, the more I searched, the more I studied, the more answers I found that confirmed the things I had believed to be true. And that's why I then began to interact with rabbis and began to do debates. Although I got a lot more challenges to do debates before I was educated. <laughs> Once I got educated, <laughs> the challenges seemed to die down. And even someone like Rabbi Singer that, that, that you, uh, you debated, uh, it's very interesting that he he challenged you without background in this, right? As opposed to areas where you had more background, whereas right. he's refused to debate me now for over 30 years. We we did a private debate in the home of a Russian Messianic Jew, kind of spontaneous. Neither of us knew it was coming. He asked me personally not to release those tapes, so we never did because some folks just recorded it impromptu. And then okay. subsequently, we did a debate that, that Sid Roth hosted and a live debate. And then we took the material, Tovia Sid and I reduced it to fit a 90 minute cassette tape. So we took out some of the extra phone calls and things like that, because it was, it was too long. If you remember the old days, you could only get 90 minutes on a cassette oh, yeah. tape. Um, that's been out widely and he's refused to debate me, interact with me under any circumstance. Now it's over 30 years, which should, should tell you something. Uh, right. In fact, he's, yeah. he's refused to debate some other Messianic Jewish scholars over the years, which should also tell you something. Uh, right. No. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's uh, and I know that's why I was selected as well because I was a uh, you know easy easy target. He didn't know that you were going to be so kind to help me. Well, and and, um, and that you were going to be such a careful student of the word and prepare so thoughtfully as well. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Well, you'll notice, and and you you pointed it out in the review too that I didn't dig deep into the Hebrew or the uh, you know the the prophetic 
literature as understood, the rabbinic literature, things like that. I, I really tried to stick with really the resurrection to me was yeah, what yeah. it all comes down to. Yeah. So how do you, when you're dealing, like I, I was just recently on a show called Tanakh Talk, where I was supposed to answer the question about the prophecies about the Messiah dying and being raised on the third day. And what it, it just kept going through my mind, we're going to keep talking past each other until we come to terms about the resurrection. Because if it's true, then the Christian interpretation of the Tanakh is true. Yeah. And vice versa. So how do you approach it when you're talking with Jewish folks today? Is there a, is there a, a general approach that you have, especially on prophecy? No, it all depends on who you're talking to. In other words, a religious Jew versus a secular Jew, a mocker versus a seeker. Uh, I, oh, I know Jewish people that came to faith through the Messianic prophecies. You know, many, 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 many have done that over, over the centuries, of course. Sure. I know others like me who came to faith through an encounter with Jesus in a church setting or just alone reading a, reading a New Testament for the first time and only learned about the Messianic prophecies afterwards. But right. your, your point is well taken. If Yeshua, in fact, rose from the dead, then, then God raised him from the dead. And this is a confirmation of the words that he spoke. Therefore, we go back and see, okay, where is it that he is prefigured in the Hebrew Bible? Uh, where is it that his resurrection is prefigured? If he doesn't rise from the dead, we never ask that question. We never go back and look be because right. he, was, he was a false claimant. So all the claims about Moses spoke about me or the scripture spoke about me, well, obviously they didn't because what he said didn't come to pass. If someone says, well, no, God said he would test Israel, Deuteronomy 13, and if a prophet came and worked a miracle and then said, follow other gods, don't listen be because, because uh, this is a test from God to see if you really cleave to him and not follow other gods. The breakdown here, number one, is that Yeshua never taught us to follow other gods. He, right. he pointed to the to the God and Father of Israel, uh, to yeah, the God of the Tanakh. The right. right. That's one yeah. thing. The second thing is you would have to say, though, that God raised him from the dead as a test to see whether Israel would, would follow him. And he's resurrected to this day working miracles. So it would be an ongoing act of deception from God backing right. the claims of the Messiah uh, so, I mean, it gets so completely outlandish and self-contradictory. Uh, Tovia has a video where he misquotes Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, we're doing a series called Answering the Rabbis. We, I've got my five volumes on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. We've got a 22-hour series, Countering the Counter Missionaries. But we started doing a series of videos. We'll, we'll deal with Tovia's first. He's got so many things out there, often on Tanakh Talk or other things like that, where he will attack Christians and Christian faith. So he went from his mission decades ago, which was dealing with Jewish people and, and trying to get them to stop believing in Jesus or some cult or other religion. Uh, he shifted some time back to aggressively attacking the faith of Christians. He knows full well if he used his same canon of criticism on the Hebrew Bible, he would demolish the faith of Jewish people instantly. In other words, the way he attacks the New Testament, it's erroneous, it means this and that. He right. knows full well if he used that same kind of criticism on the Hebrew Bible, let alone on the Talmud. If he was attacking the Talmud, he'd make a mo he'd be one of the leading anti-Semites online in terms of using his method of, of criticism of the New Testament, turn that on the Talmud. And yeah, he'll, he'll totally make agree. a mockery of it and, 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 and on and on. Even, even he'll pull a quote from some... Christian leader today and, and show how outlandish crazy this. Well, he knows he could pull similar quotes from rabbis uh, that, that are outlandish right. and crazy and out there. So, yep. but your average Christian is not used to this. They're not expecting the attack. So he's found it to be fertile ground to attack the faith of Christians. Of, of course, I look at it as unfortunate, but just another way of, of sifting because there's so many hundreds sure. of millions that believe around the world, there's going to be some sifting of, of our faith. But in, in short, Almost every one of his videos is not just flawed, but has a fatal flaw, has, has a yeah. fatal weak spot, has something embarrassingly wrong to anyone that knows the text, especially in the original languages. So yeah, here, not even biblically, though, but I think even logically, there's a lot of flawed thinking there, too, in the way he's trying to sum up his conclusions. Yeah, and, uh, obviously, if someone's going to watch it critically, sure. So 1 Corinthians 15, he says that, you know, Paul says that uh, uh, there's a scripture that says that Messiah would rise on the third day. Well, actually, Paul refers to scriptures, plural. 
scriptures. Right. That's exactly. the first thing saying, I'm not looking at just one text, scriptures. Then you go back and look at from, from Hosea 6, he'll raise us up on the third day to yep. Genesis 22, that, that uh, Abraham and Isaac will come back on the third day to other deliverances in the Bible on the third day. And, the, and you think, whoa, there's, there's a whole range of stuff. And if Messiah, in fact, rose from the dead, you look back and think, whoa, check this out. This is amazing. Right. So what we want to do in our witness is, is combine these realities. He, he is not just the most influential Jew who ever lived, Yeshua. He is not just the Jewish person who has brought hundreds of millions of Gentiles to worship the God of Israel, but he's done it specifically in his role as the Jewish Messiah. And, and hey, yeah. did you know that our own scriptures say that he would be rejected by our people before he was received? Did you know that it said he died a criminal's death and yet live on? Did you know this was in our Bible? So it all depends on where the person's at in terms of our approach. But once questions come up, sooner or later, we're going to be dealing with the prophecies. Right. Yeah, that's the big, the big thing. That's, and that's interesting. So uh, in, your, in your journey of reconciling your Jewish heritage, uh, like I, I was watching a, um, a, co a commentary or a video from a woman named Jen, Jen Rosner. Brilliant. She's a professor, Jewish, was, became, came to the faith and thought she needed to leave the Jewish stuff behind and has undergone somewhat of a, a, a change of heart and understood that she can embrace her Jewishness and embrace her Savior. When, when you're talking to um, Jewish, you know, either secular or religious who don't believe in Jesus, are, do, are they taking the point of view or are they afraid that they might need to leave some Jewishness behind or, or leave their identity behind? Uh, some are. Uh, let, let's look at on a few different levels. Bear in mind that among secular Jews, intermarriage is very, very high. And in sure. some cases, it's a, a, a Jew marrying a Catholic or something, but they're both nominal and they're going to raise their kids with no religion or they agree, you know, whichever direction the kids are going to want to go or the one does an outward conversion to Judaism, or the other does an outward conversion to Catholicism. So that's skin deep stuff, really. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the only way that that person is going to be concerned about losing Jewishness is just this gut level recognition that, that Jews often have, that it's important that we're Jews, and that there's, there's some reason that we maintain this identity and that the world has hated us for it. And it's very easy to say, well, this is going to strengthen your identity. And I can't tell you how many Messianic Jews I know that were totally secular, totally nominal, and coming to faith in Yeshua is what stirred up a connection to Israel for them. And oh, many of them cool. live in Israel now. They moved there with their whole families. Their kids served in the IDF. They are thoroughly wow. Israeli citizens. That never would have happened if not for their faith in Yeshua. Even though I do not live a religious Jewish lifestyle, and I don't try to give any false impressions about that, Anyone behind, anyone watching can see all the rabbinic books behind me. Jewishness became much more important to me as a follower of Yeshua, not in terms of salvation or, God forbid, any notion of spiritual superiority. Uh, I, I came to faith through Gentile Christians who prayed me into the kingdom. And from day one, we were, we were one in the Lord. It never dawned on me that there was a higher or lower status or some type of class system or caste system in the body. God forbid. And, and and that it's explicit that just as there's not, neither male nor female or slave nor free, there's neither Jew nor Gentile in yeah. terms of caste system or class system within the body. But my whole interest in Hebrew, my whole interest in learning rabbinic literature and better understanding my culture and tradition, my whole burden for the Jewish people, my sense of solidarity with the Jewish people, my standing for Israel, all of these things are a direct result of my faith in Jesus. So I want to tell That's a Jewish beautiful. person, hey, you're born a Jew, you're going to die a Jew. That you can't change. But what kind of Jew will you be? Will you be one who will be a light to the world as, as per our calling and destiny? You'll be one who follows the Jewish Messiah, even if it brings reproach. That's the question to ask. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. So let's, let's take a look at the opposite side of the coin. So we've got Messianic Judaism, which would be broadly defined as, as ethnically Jewish people who have come to faith in Jesus. The opposite side of the coin is the Hebrew Roots Movement, which I, which I call Torahism. Uh, because, and just to make this distinction clear, the Torah, in my opinion, in my belief, is the Torah is a beautiful and fundamental part of the Christian faith. 
So it's not a rejection of the Torah, but Torahism is this misapplication and misunderstanding of the commands of Yahweh. And so what we see on that side very often, and I talk to a number of, um, uh, uh, of rabbis at the Messiah Conference who have Gentiles that come into their Messianic Jewish congregation and start to want to change things. Um, and they're very much, these rabbis identified it as what they felt was an identity issue. Mm-hmm. That somehow the Hebrew roots folks as Gentiles, which I'm a Gentile, they somehow feel more holy or like you were talking about some extra level of connection by then keeping the Jewish feasts or, or we, what we, we might call the, the mosaic traditions, the, the weekly Shabbat, the kosher food, the circumcision, all the, you know, the Torah feasts, all those sorts of things. What would you say to Gentiles who, who are looking at or, or are into that lifestyle? walking out their faith in that way. So first thing, we must all affirm the basics and find our identity as children of God, not as Jews, Gentiles, males, females, black, white, whatever. We must absolutely find our identity in Jesus, in Yeshua. In that regard, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, and then reiterates it in Galatians, that circumcision is nothing. That what matters is a new creation. What matters is keeping God's commandments. And what's interesting is that in the Jewish mind, circumcision is an important mitzvah, commandment, but Paul's saying as, as far as salvation, it, it has, has no significance whatsoever. What matters is a new creation. He right. also says in Galatians 5 that the reason uh, some of these people, we call them Judaizers sometimes, which can be a term that's misunderstood, but the only reason they were preaching circumcision was to avoid the reproach of the cross, which is a profound and very interesting statement. But yeah. number one, we start at the same place that our identity is being in Jesus. And, and that is our fundamental identity of who we are. And that's what matters most in eternity. That's first thing. The second thing we have to do is follow the guidelines clearly laid out in the New Testament that, that Paul says, this is the rule in all the congregations in 1 Corinthians 7. If you're called, meaning called to salvation, circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. Now it's metaphorical there, but in the ancient Jewish Greek world at that time, there was actually an uncircumcision operation. Can you imagine it back then without <laughs> anesthesia and, and whatever brutal surgery was involved? But yeah. because the, Olymp- the, the, the the athletic games were conducted in the nude. So right. if you're a Jewish man and you wanted to participate, but you were thoroughly Hellenized and wanted to, to look and feel Greek, well, you got to deal with that circumcision issue. So there was an actual uncircumcision surgery, but he's talking metaphorically here. Sure. If you're called to the Lord circumcised, so you're, you're living as a Jew, don't become uncircumcised. If you're called uncircumcised, don't become circumcised. We each have our unique identity. We each bring our own unique riches and experience and life with us into the body. And our unity comes through our diversity. That That's the key thing for us to understand. Now, for me, I was living very much like a Gentile. I was bar mitzvahed, but I, I had no interest in keeping the holidays. If left to myself, I never would have gone to synagogue at all. If left to myself, I probably wouldn't have been bar mitzvahed. If left to myself, I, I would not have continued to celebrate Hanukkah when I got out of the house. It just was not in my mind sure. at all. So for me to now suddenly start dressing up like a Hasidic Jew and being ultra traditional would have made no sense whatsoever. So for me, it's more been a matter of, okay, Lord, in your sight, how do I express my Jewishness? What, what does that look like? How do I walk that out? What's my own relationship to Torah? We know the Sinai covenant is past and that we're under new and better covenant. But what does that yeah. look like? God puts his Torah on our hearts. What does that look like? And that's, that's an ongoing thing that I walk out as a Jewish believer in Jesus. And among Messianic Jews, you'll have the same range as you have in the world. You'll have those who are much more traditional, and those who are much more secular in terms of Jewish lifestyle, right? So some are in churches. The great majority of Jewish believers in America are in churches. Some are in Messianic congregations. And then within Messianic congregations, some are more traditional than others. But here's the key thing. People often mix in rabbinic Judaism as well, and will now add in a lot of traditions of the rabbis. What most Messianic Jews do is say, hey, we have many traditions, preserved as among our people. Let's see those that we find redemptive, or let's see those that we think go back to the time of Jesus, 
Yeah. Or, or which, you know, for example, burying someone within 24 hours in Judaism, unless they, they, they die on the Sabbath, burying them within 24 hours. And, and, you know, that for many Messianic Jews, that's still a sacred thing. Sitting Shiva, where people come for a week afterwards, just your home and fill your home and comfort and encourage it. Many find that's a beautiful tradition. We keep that, but it's not because we're under rabbinic authority. You have some that are teach that we are under rabbinic authority that's very dangerous, that's very wrong, and that's a real trap. Okay, now we go to the other side. You saved as a Gentile Christian. Uh, you were raised in a church that was maybe replacement theology that didn't see any more promises for Israel, the Jewish people. You begin to study and realize, wow, there is a purpose for Israel. God still gave promises. And, and wow, a lot of our church theology has been wrong. And where does the New Testament say that the Sabbath is now Sunday? It's not there. And right. and where, you know, so you start going through things and asking valid questions about the Jewish roots of the faith. The error becomes when you think that somehow you are adding to your spirituality, you are going to be a better witness to the Jewish people. You're going to be something by being, quote, more Jewish. And I want to say two more things here, then, then we can probe this further. In 1984, as I was praying about a lot of these issues, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, and everyone tests this, obviously, it's not a scripture I'm quoting. I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, the whole, quote, Jewish temptation is in the soul realm. So in the realm of the emotions, the desires, so it's, it it's, can feel spiritual, but it's soulish. The whole, quote, Jewish temptation, I want to be Jew. Oh, if I could just grow a beard, and obviously you don't have a beard for that reason, right? But if I could just grow a beard as a man, or if I could, as a woman, wear like more traditional Jewish dress, or maybe we like the Shabbat candles, or maybe, you know, add in a new moon celebration. The whole, quote, Jewish temptation is in the soul realm. It will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. So be on your guard. I uh, thought the it, Lord it, speaks wow. that to me as a Jew, and I'd never sure. been to a Messianic congregation at that point. It will fascinate. Wow. I never knew this. This is amazing. Stimulate. Wow, I just want to study more than I ever have. Complicate. Well, or this, I mean, Christmas, we go to the family, the in-laws, but maybe we shouldn't because pagan and I know they have pork. And then suffocate. Before you know it, the, these people have, have withered spiritually. They yeah. don't share. I, I see that pattern so many times in the in the folks that I deal with. Yeah, I get I get messages. I get a lot less than you, I'm sure, but dozens of messages every week from people who are dealing with this kind of the the damage, the suffocation of it in their families, in their marriages, and their even their churches. And that that step, the progression you just laid out is it's so it's universal. Yeah, one of, one of my friends, leading Messianic Jewish theologian. Uh, has said to me that a, a year does not go by where he does not share that quote. Because I shared it with him when we first met in 84. And I believe it's it's a, a true word from the Lord, fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. If yeah. you just talk to the people at, that are in the later stages, the complicate, suffocate, well, let's just get together and worship Yeshua. Well, I, I don't know. Well, can I worship him? Or is that idolatrous? I'm really not sure. Right. Well, when's the last time you just preach Jesus to someone as opposed to you have to observe the Torah? Well, no, Jesus is the Torah. And, 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 you know, and I don't even say Jesus anymore because that's great. It like comes from Zeus. Like, where, where are you getting this stuff from? I know. And yeah. the prayer, prayer life is down. It's, it's inevitable. And then often the final step is complete apostasy. And even yeah. conversion to Judaism would just end up in this nowhere land. So the other thing I wanted to say was that when people now say that it is incumbent on Gentile Christians to observe the Torah, that's where they have stepped off into serious error. It, it's one thing if they say, you know, I, just, I love being in a Messianic congregation as a Gentile. And, and just like there are Jews in churches, I was Gentile. I, I love going to a Messianic congregation. And God never changed the Sabbath. So I... That's that's my Sabbath. Okay, fine. No, where does it yeah. say that a Gentile Christian could not celebrate the seventh day Sabbath? Nowhere. Nowhere. And, yeah. You know, if God told Israel not to eat these foods, like I don't want to eat them either. Okay, fine, no problem. But right. if you now find your identity, you're going to try to look Jewish outwardly, or you feel okay as a man. I have to wear a yarmulke. Where where where's that come from? That's rabbinic tradition. That's not in the Bible. No one in right. Bible days wore yarmulke. And there was no head covering for religious purposes. You know, the high priests wore a head covering. There was, there was no Jews didn't wear yarmulkes or have head coverings for religious purposes. That, that postdates the New Testament. 
So you start doing these outward things. And then worst of all, and I can tell you this as a Jewish believer that's on the front lines of Jewish evangelism has been for almost 50 years now. This is one of the most harmful things to our witness. When Gentile Christians start pretending that they're Jews, it brings reproach to what we do. It makes our faith look like a mockery. And I can tell you firsthand, I know of ultra-religious Jews, so ultra-Orthodox Jews, that people raise their whole lives. I mean, 17, 18 years old uh, in, 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 in Jewish high school, in yeshiva, and they're studying from eight in the morning till midnight, you know, studying prayer. I mean, that's how they're living, right? And, and they're starting, their eyes are being opened. They're starting to realize that Yeshua is the Messiah. They're on their way to coming to faith. And then they read about this Gentile Christian guy who was posing as a Jew, and boom, they pull back. I mean, I mean, this, this happened wow. in recent months. So wow, the, I didn't know that. the amount of reproach this brings, I was doing a, a presentation with a colleague in Florida on a Friday night a few years ago. And it, it was, uh, we, were, we were talking about, it was a totally Christian presentation. And I see in the back door, a guy walks in dressed like a Hasidic Jew. I mean, head to toe, he's got the beard, he's got the outfit, he's got the fringes, he's got the whole bit. Just like a Hasidic Jew. And I told my Christian colleague, I said, I guarantee you he's not Jewish. 100% guarantee it. Well, how do I know it? Well, number one, I was going to ask. If he's ultra Orthodox, he doesn't live right nearby that, that church. There's not a community there. And he can't drive on the Sabbath or be driven. So he has to walk. So he's not going to be there at a church meeting on a, uh, at a seminary on, on, a, on a Friday night. That's the first thing. And second thing, I just tell, I've been around long enough, I can tell. So uh, sure enough, he comes up to me afterwards to, to chat because if he, if, he, if he was ultra-Orthodox and came to the faith, he's still living an ultra-Orthodox lifestyle for the most part. And if he's got that outfit on, then he's right. observing the other traditions because it's not an outfit to him. It's part of his life. It's part of his culture. It's part of his background. Right? Sure. So if you're going to wear that outfit, it, it, it would be like me wearing a, some, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, activists, you know, PETA shirt, a- activists against killing animals, right? And I'm wearing that T-shirt and, and I'm doing a live podcast for that cause while, while eating a cheeseburger at McDonald's. <laughs> you're not going to do that. So if it's just an outfit, well, then you're not going to keep the traditions. If it's not an outfit, you're still keeping the traditions. So I talked to him afterwards, nice guy. And I said, so why do you have the whole Hasidic he goes, I just love Jews. I just love the Jewish people. It's, it's my way of showing solidarity. So I, I don't want to insult the guy or hurt him. I just kind of smiled and left it there. But that makes us all look like a bunch of mockers. It is, it is no different than we see Admiral Richard Levine, who is now, quote, Rachel winning, you know, some woman of the year thing or courageous woman or, or the first four-star female admiral. It's like it makes, right. it makes the whole thing look like a mockery. And it's the same thing here. So I urge every Gentile Christian, don't try to look like a religious Jew. Don't put on the garb. Don't, don't, don't try to keep all the traditions and think that this is somehow going to uh, enhance your witness to the Jewish people or show, uh, build a bridge for right. faith in Jesus or make you any holier. If you say, hey, look, I'm free to observe dietary laws. I'm free to serve the feast. I, I find beauty and meaning in it. God bless you. Wonderful. Good for you. Yeah. You know, I got no issue with that. And, and there's the diversity in the body there, right? It's um, beautiful. Yeah. It, and, yeah. And, and let it be, let it shine. Let there be messianic congregations. Let there be, let, let there be Christian churches. Uh, ideally where there's been a separation, let's fix that where Easter yeah. was separated from Passover. Let's, let's bring Easter back into the Passover season as it started. And so let's celebrate Messiah's death and resurrection within Passover. So where separations have come, let's let's do what we have to do to fix that, right? But otherwise, let there be the diversity. But the idea of a Gentile Christian either obligated to observe Torah, that is a dangerous doctrine that leads to no good, or that it will somehow help your witness to the Jewish people, or that it will somehow make you more spiritual those are all deceptions. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned that because that's a a analogy I've used before is the idea of Gentiles wanting to be Jewish is very similar to a man feeling inside like he's a woman and dressing 
accordingly. And, and for me, the thing that, that really jumped out at me in that analogy and what you just said is this loss of identity. It's like a, a, God made me a Gentile. He, he, he had me born in this country, in this time in history, to the family I was born to as a Gentile for a reason. The same way he had you born to a Jewish family. Yeah, yeah. And so for us to want to walk away from either our gender or our ethnic identity in terms of Jew and Gentile, either way is kind of turning our backs on what God had intended for us. Yeah, and it's not like one thing is sinful. In other words, right. I got saved as a drug addict, so you leave the drugs behind. But but one, one of my Israeli friends was asked many years ago, how does it feel to be a converted Jew? He goes, I don't know, because it's not a sin to be a Jew. I'm a converted sinner. <laughs> so oh, that's good. what you're yeah. saying is we're not talking about a sinful identity, just like right. being a man or a woman is not sinful or a Gentile or a Jew is, is not sinful. And, and here's the thing that's, that's beautiful. Christians are recognizing the Jewish roots of the faith. They're recognizing the validity of Jewish believers living as Jews. Now, within the Messianic movement, you have a debate. There are some Messianic Jews who say there's a calling on all Jewish believers on some level to, to adhere to a Jewish lifestyle. Right. be it Sabbath observance, be it dietary laws, be it uh, keeping of the, of the biblical calendar, not for salvation, but for covenantal calling. Sure. Others would say it's, it's an individual calling as Jews because we all got saved from different backgrounds and came into the faith in different ways. So Paul's principle of remaining where you were when you were called is going to work itself out. So I have dear friends who are on the, the one side saying it's a calling, it's taken for granted that Jewish believers will continue to have some Jewish identity, recognizing the radical changes that have come with the destruction of the temple and, and the institution of the new covenant. And there are others, and I'd be more in the second camp, that say that it's going to be individual. It's going to work itself out differently individually. But we, we all agree on these fundamentals, that, that the faith as it started was very much Jewish and exclusively so. The big question in the early church was, can you be a Gentile and follow Jesus without becoming right. a Jew? It switched in church history to can you be a Jew and follow Jesus w without becoming a Gentile? You yeah. know, a quick, Sadly, yeah. a quick joke that, that uh, most of your viewers have not heard. So during the days when the Catholic Church prohibited eating of meat on Friday, there was a Catholic community in Europe and there was one Jewish guy in the community. And uh, it was not religious himself, but every Friday he would cook up a, uh, an amazing steak on his grill outside and everyone could smell it through the neighborhood and they were not allowed to eat meat on Friday. So they called the priest and father, can you please do something about it? He goes, look, I'll try. So he meets with the guy for a period of, of months and the guy converts to Catholicism and no, no meat on Friday. Everybody's happy. And then suddenly what's that? There's the smell of beef wafting through the neighborhood. So they call the priest. He runs over to the guy's house. He said, what are you doing? He says, what do you mean? He said, you know, you're Catholic. You, you can't eat, you can't eat uh, meat on Friday. He goes, it's not meat. Said, what are you talking about? He said, that's, that's fish. He said, what are you talking about? Look at that. That's not fish. That's red beef. You're cooking. Smell it. It's beef. He goes, no, no, father, I learned that from you. He said, that's, that's not beef. That's, that's fish. He said, what are you talking about? He said, remember a few weeks ago, you sprinkled water on me and you said to me, you're no longer a Jew, you're a Christian. He said, well, that's what I did with the beef. I sprinkled some water on and said, you're no longer a beef, you're, you're, you're fish. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we don't stop being Jewish when we get saved. It's the most common thing right. when you, you talk to a Jewish person, say, I'm a Jew who believes in Jesus, to say, you were a Jew. You were a Jew. Right. That's what they immediately think. And so, so thankfully, there's been a great shift in the body, a recognition of the Jewish roots of the faith, a recognition that it's perfectly fine for Jews to live as Jews. I remember when I first saw Messianic Jewish congregations as a fairly new believer, I thought there was something wrong. I thought there was something heretical about it. And why are you going backwards? Because I, even though I'd read the New Testament over and over and over, I just never realized that it was taken for granted that Jewish believers and Acts lived as Jewish believers. The question was, do Gentiles have to do it? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then these are all positive things, but the pendulum swings too far. So it's, it swings in, in, in the anti-Semitic way, and then it swings in the way of what you would call Torahism, 
Yeah, no, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and the middle way is what we're called to. Paul talks about that all the time. You know, the antinomianism is not an option, nor is this, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very frustrating because as you were talking about, I'm thinking about, do you know Don Finto? Sure. Yeah, so I met with him a while back. He lives around here in Nashville. And um, he was telling me a very interesting story about the Jesus movement. He was a pastor of, the, of a big church downtown Nashville for about 25 years. And during the Jesus movement, he started to see all kinds of Jewish people in the hippie culture kind of thing, all come to faith in yeah. Jesus. And that's kind of what got him into this whole idea. And what's interesting is that at the same time, kind of the same thing you mentioned, there was this preconceived understanding of what a Jew and a Gentile is. And so you've got this idea that, yeah, people, okay, you used to be a Jew, but now you're a Christian. You know, that, that, that's a separation. It's a change of identity kind of thing. But what I'm seeing today in the work that I'm doing in, in the Hebrew wor roots world is the exact opposite. People are saying that they are no longer Gentiles because of Romans 11, you're grafted into Israel and you know, you're not part of the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2, right? So what would you say to, to those folks who believe that once, you're, once you come to faith in Jesus, you're now a true Israelite and no longer a Gentile? I would ask why Paul refers to them directly as Gentiles in Romans 11. Why he explicitly says, now I'm writing to you Gentiles. And as much as I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, and I'm calling you to provoke Israel to, to envy. He yeah. explicitly makes a distinction between the Gentiles and Israel. And if you just read through Romans 9 through 11, it was the perfect place, the perfect place for him to say, you Gentiles are now real Jews. Look, the end of Romans 2, you, you, you could argue that, that Paul is talking about two Jews between two Jews who's the real one, the one circumcised outwardly only or outwardly in, or, and inwardly, or, or you could say that he's talking about a Jew and a Gentile and a Jew who, who is circumcised outwardly but not following the Lord is not a real Jew, but spiritually speaking, a Gentile who's circumcised inwardly is a real Jew. Even if he makes that spiritual point, then the very next verse, well, then what's the advantage of being a Jew, being circumcised? He's, he's talking about literal sure, Jews, and he yeah. does through the rest of, of the book. I challenge anyone to, to get a Greek concordance and look at every time the word Jew, Jews appears in the New Testament, the same, the same with Israel, and see if there's any single time where there's an explicit reference to a Gentile. Even if you argue that there's a metaphorical, like I'm a Jew in my heart, okay, you will not find a single reference where people are addressed as Jews or uh, even in, in Philippians where, where Paul writes in Philippians three, we are the circumcision. Some say he's talking about him and, and other fellow Jewish believers. Otherwise, spiritually, we're the ones who've been circumcised in heart, which is what matters as opposed to those who are trying to get you to be circumcised outwardly. Right. But why is it that Paul explicitly writes them as Gentiles called to provoke Israel to jealousy. And, and, and why is it that, that Paul makes distinctions constantly between Jew and Gentile in terms of who they actually are? Why does he say in Colossians 4, these are the only Jews, these are the only ones among the circumcised in, in, in my group? Why is it that he allowed Timothy to be circumcised because there was ambiguity with his parents? Is he Jewish or not? Yes, he is. Be circumcised. But he would not allow Titus to be circumcised. He's right. making it very plain. That this, this is not the distinction you are to make. Why is he so explicit in 1 Corinthians 7? If you're saved, uncircumcised, don't become circumcised. Remain in the calling you had when you were called to the Lord. He, he couldn't yeah. be any more clear about it. Why is it by the time you get to Acts 21 and, and, and Jacob, James, is telling Paul about the, the tens of thousands of Jews who believe in Yeshua and are zealous for the Torah, why is it in the same chapter references yeah, the Gentiles didn't have to come under this. And, and, and when the Gentiles heard this, Acts 15, they were glad because they knew right. before they could become Jews, go through the men, go through circumcision, everyone go through ritual immersion, take on the 613 commandments and so on. They knew they could have equal status with Jews by doing that, but they had never done it. Now they're being told without doing that, you have equal status. So it, it was all clearly understood. The distinctions were there. Look, I, I'm dealing a lot with the Hebrew Israelite cult these days. Oh yeah, I saw and your interview with uh, I forgot. Guerrilla Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, and 
not a day goes by where I'm not blasted on YouTube in the most ugly, anti-Semitic, hateful ways. You know, you white Edomite devil and Hitler kill all your oh, people because you're it. imposters. I, I get actually more comments per group from Hebrew Israelites on our YouTube channel than anyone. So I'm glad they're I'm glad they're listening. But the point is, you you do have some legitimate uh, black Jews. One African American Jewish website estimates there could be two hundred thousand. Uh, black Jews in America. It's a high estimate, but let's just say that that's accurate. So uh, there was a, a discussion between two uh, brilliant black professors, uh, Glenn Lowry and John, uh, John McWhorter. I probably mispronounced the last name. Uh, and they're talking about at the end of this, a bit about the Hebrew Israelite phenomenon. So the absolute horrific injustice done to these Africans who were kidnapped wrenched from their heritage, brought over here, but they lost a sense of identity. They lost a sense of heritage. So many of them now have found their identity in saying, we're Israelites. We're Israelites. And that's who we are. And and look, they were the slaves and the cursed ones, the enslaved, the cursed ones. That's us. So it's the same thing with, with Gentile Christians doing this. The difference is that these Gentile Christians have something many of these Hebrew Israelites do not, which is a real faith in Jesus and a real True. identity in him, that should be enough for you. Amen. The, the fact that I'm a Jewish believer, that's just my lived experience. In other words, it doesn't, doesn't add or take away anything for me in terms of being a child of God or in terms of eternal life or forgiveness of sins, right. where I have an inside track and you don't, or God looks at us and says, well, Mike's my boy, you know, Rob's kind of like a secondary kid. No, it's, it's not like that at all. It's, it's just my lived experience, just like my lived experience as a male. But none right. of those things in, impinge on my ultimate identity as a child of God. And, and that's oh, what we have to said. realize. Yeah. We need everybody to be who they are in the Lord for the good of the body, for the harmony of the body. It, like Paul says, yes. if, if, if the whole body was, a, was an ear, where would the sight be? If the whole body was an eye, where would the hearing be? Let, right. let the diversity yeah. and beauty shine. And through I, that, makes me think of, of, of Revelation 7, where yes. you've got all the tribes of Israel and people from every language and people and tongue gathered together, worshiping the Lord. That's the diversity, unity in diversity, right? In the kingdom. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. And again, so that, oh, go ahead. in America, the vast majority of people attending Messianic congregations are actually Gentiles. Uh, oh, in America, the leaders of the congregations are called rabbis. In Israel, they're not called rabbis. They, they don't use that term in Israel. Um, okay. And there, they, they want to make clear they're not rabbis because that's a very different part of the culture and, and the religious scene that they're saying that's not who we, who we are. Uh, but unless you're in a, a, a really Jewish city with a high percentage of Jews, like, like maybe Brooklyn, New York, and, and you have a Messianic congregation there where you'll have a higher percentage of Jews. In most of the communities where Messianic congregations exist, they're predominantly Gentile. And uh, sometimes the leaders are Gentile as well. That's fine if they have a calling to display certain aspects of Jewish roots or say to the Jewish community, hey, uh, this is a place where Jews can continue to be Jews and follow Jesus. That's fine. But we, we just have to realize that the legitimacy questions are going to come up. Right. The questions of yeah. authenticity are going to come up when that's the case. And it's, it's better to not try to be something you're not. Rather show, okay, we're a union of Jews and Gentiles who worship the God of Israel. And this is our expression. Okay, great. Yeah. Hey, but don't you think it's a, it's a bit of a slippery slope even to begin that process? I mean, not to begin it. I, I guess it's very easy to get out of balance. Mm-hmm. Like, like I celebrated a, a Passover Seder with a Messianic Jewish family through, through Jews for Jesus. Uh, and it was an amazing experience for me to see all the ways that Christ was you know, foretold. Um, and so that's not part of my regular expression of my faith. That happened one year and I loved it. And I'm, I wouldn't you know, be surprised if I did it again. And you know, at the Messiah conference, I ate kosher all week because that's all they served and that sort of thing. So there's so there's no no danger in it in and of itself. But once you start to assimilate that into your faith walk, well, why is it thing, why is it why should a Christian be in a church and celebrating Easter at a, a date separated from when things happen biblically because of anti-Semitism and constant in Constantine and Nicene Creed times? You know, why is that better? In, in other words, why is what? 
Isn't the slippery slope in both directions? Yeah, I think you could say that for sure. There's definitely been far too dramatic of a separation from our Jewish roots, from our Hebrew roots of the faith. Yeah, so I, I, right, exactly. So it's not a slippery slope if you keep your right perspective. Because yeah, I, true. I, I know Gentile believers who've been part of Messianic congregations for decades, and they are Jesus loving Gentiles, and they can talk about Jesus Christ or they can talk about Yeshua the Messiah, and they're balanced and sound. And I know, you know, uh, tons of, of Jesus loving Christians in, in uh, Sunday morning church settings that love Israel and pray for the Jewish people. I, I think we just have to look for symptoms. In, in other words, a good way to look when at I it, deal yeah. with people that hold to replacement theology, supersessionism on some level, well, they may not be anti-Semites, but I know through the centuries that that very teaching has been the, the door to anti-Semitism in church history in horrific ways. Yeah, and absolutely. to this day, I don't know a single person who is so pro-Palestinian that they are anti-Israel a Christian who's so pro-Palestinian that they're anti-Israel, who is not replacement theology. Nor conversely, do I know anyone who rejects replacement theology who, who also rejects Israel today. So our theology will work itself out. So yeah. if I see someone who's recovered Jewish roots of the faith and in a healthy way, and maybe they, they go to church, they love their home church, but they really look forward to celebrating the feasts with Messianic congregation, great. Or... They just really feel all their lives they've, they've had a calling to be close to Jewish people and in solidarity with Jewish people. And they really like the teaching more in the Messianic congregation. They, they find it's, it's more in depth or there's more of a focus to pray for Israel. Great. Fine. Right. But where, wherever you see the unhealthy tendency, that's where it has to be addressed. And because you're seeing it a lot in Hebrew roots, r- right off the bat, a lot of it is unhealthy. And then yeah. often with heretical views or with sacred name cult kind of stuff, or maybe denying the inspiration of a book of the New Testament or so on. The moment you see these things, you see the, it, that's when the red flag should come up immediately. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And you, you bring up a good point. I'm probably a little bit biased based on who, who I'm interacting with an awful lot. Yeah, it's um, it's all yeah, right. the worlds we live in, of course. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So looking at it from the perspective of, a healthy relationship with Christ, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, what, like putting on kind of your pastor hat, if you were talking to folks who are feeling like I hear all the time, they'll even admit, hey, keeping these things, these, you know, kosher food and the feast isn't a matter of salvation, they'll say, but it is a matter of righteousness or obedience, you know, and, and I just, I get a sense that they're missing something, that their focus is off. I mean, is there is there something that you would see that there, that you're missing when you start to put put your okay we can even grant that it's not a salvation issue but they're saying that it's an obedience issue right this is how you show your love for Jesus by eating kosher right so so number one I would encourage them to really spend several months focusing on worshiping the Lord on exalting Jesus Yeshua uh, read books that exalt Him sing worship songs that exalt him, meditate on scriptures about who he is, his words, his life, his death, his resurrection, really press into knowing him more intimately and asking him to be glorified in your eyes. Start there. Everyone would agree that's a good and healthy thing to do, right. but it's it's also a reality check if we start started to stray. So that's that's number one. Number two, I would then challenge that person that they are absolutely falling short left and right, that they are in no way a Torah observant. And I would just go through example after example after example where they either have to justify this or re-explain this or reinterpret this or so on and so forth. I would push that and say, look, you're not under the Sinai covenant. And let me just ask you something. If Israel had full uh, theocratic, uh, uh, if, if we could, if we could live this out now in America, should we, should we stone Sabbath breakers? Should we put adulterers to death? Should we burn sorceresses? Should, should we stone to death, uh, unrepentant, rebellious teenagers, etc.? Well, right. no, this, well, why has it changed? How, how has it changed? Where has it changed? And, and if you go through the content of the Torah, and you'll see that 75% of the, quote, forever 
text. So I, I get into this in volume four of answering Jewish objections to Jesus. 75% of the forever texts require, so you know, you'll keep this for all generations or forever, require a functioning temple, priesthood, and Jewish autonomy in the land, which means that for almost all of our history, the vast majority of Jewish history, we've been unable to keep the vast majority of the forever commandments. Either God has changed this to give us a new and better covenant, or or he has left us bereft and unable yeah. to, to keep this and without atonement as well. So first I'd get them to really refocus on Jesus. Hey, pull out the old hymns. You, I don't really like those anymore. Problem, problem. Go to a church and that loves to worship and go to their worship services and go to their prayer meetings. Well, I'm un- uncomfortable because they're not true. All right, you're, you're already on, on the wrong path. So if they cannot fully participate in worship of Jesus, and I, I emphasize that because that's the that's like the stickiest point of all that they'll start to get weak on. And be in a church service. Look, in our in our days at Beth Messiah, when I was part of a messianic congregation led by Dan Juster, we might every so often sing a hymn, you know, and, and all the songs were Jewish sounding and 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 Yeshua instead of Jesus and that kind of thing. But then we we might sing a hymn, and that was fine. Because we, we weren't separating ourselves from the body, and we'd gladly have multi services together with you know Christian believers. So you start there, reimmerse yourself there, and and if you feel uncomfortable, okay, something's already wrong. You're already straying. Then number two, I challenge you, read through every single word of Torah and to jot down everything it commands, and to say, do you affirm this or not? If, if you can't, you can't, you right. can't. And then the third thing. I would say that the New Testament explicitly warns you against this mindset. And, and even in Colossians 2 tells you, don't let anyone put you under pressure or judge you over, over these things. Right. Uh, and, you know, just ask the question again, why didn't it dawn on the Gentile believers to, to do all this? Why is it that in church history, there is no record of the early Gentile Christians all, all doing these things? In fact, they couldn't figure out why the Jewish believers did. <laughs> I mean, so it was a weak spot there, but that that was like, why are they living as Jews and continuing to follow the, the Torah? That's that's odd. They, they didn't get right. it. And just an example, people say, no, no, you're, you're missing it. Dr. Brown, I can't believe how ignorant you are of this. Acts 15, it says that Moses is read in the synagogues every, every Sabbath. So in other words, they just start them here, they'll get the rest. Right, For, starter pack. That's one of many possible interpretations. It could just as well be interpreted. Look, they've heard Moses for, for centuries, and that hasn't done it. Another way of understanding is they'll get these basic things because they're already familiar with it through, through Moses and the Torah, which yeah. is a perfectly yeah. valid way of understanding it. But here's the big thing. How do they react? How do they react in Acts 15? They rejoice when they get this wonderful news, wonderful news. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to, and that's recorded, as opposed to, oh, no, no, guys, don't rejoice. We're just getting you, this is just entry level. Of course, you have to do all that for righteousness sake. Yeah. And, and, say, I, and I think they forget that, you know, Jesus in John 16, two said, they will put you out of the synagogues for following me. And that, right. That's, of course, to the, to the Jewish believers that were in the synagogues. Right. But, so well, how were they going to let the Gentiles in who follow Jesus, but not the Jews? Well, not even, not even going to synagogues as right. much as living like Jews. The fact is, by Acts 21, it's still the same theme. We made clear the Gentiles don't have to do all this. So it's, it is explicit in the New right. Testament. If you say, I feel the Lord's put it on my heart. Well, I'm not going to argue with you. If the Lord put it on your heart to move to, to, to Timbuktu, you know, as a calling and, and to start a coffee shop there, well, do what the Lord's calling you to do, you know. But right. the moment you think it adds righteousness to you, the moment you think where Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So that means because he's God, his commandments, that's the Torah. We have to observe all the Torah. The moment you go that route, you, you are going on a dangerous path. And I've, here's the deal. I've been in the Lord now over 51 years, right? So it's not forever, but it's, it's a good chunk of time. I've never seen this end well. I have never, ever seen this end well for a Gentile who takes on this mentality. And, I've, and I say that saying I've got plenty of Gentile friends who've been part of Messianic congregations for years that love the Jewish people, that love Israel, that love their Jewish roots, but they're not trying to be Jews. So I've, I've seen plenty of, of, of healthy expressions. I know churches that have monthly Jewish root services and people come, Gentile Christians, and they love the celebration and all that, but they, they know who they are. 
Yeah. And, and the moment they go in this direction, either it's commanded for salvation. Very few would say that it, it's commanded for righteousness. It's, it's going to enhance our witness to the Jewish community. I've not seen that end well once in over 50 years. That says something. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Okay. So I want to respect your time. We'll kind of wrap it up here, but I, I did want to give you a chance. Um, to share any uh, resources. I'm not sure what you have out there, if you have anything specifically talking about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. I know you have a ton of stuff out there. Yeah, so a few things I'd recommend in, in written form. My book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People, is my most translated volume. It came out in 1992. It's been continuously in print. We, we did an update and revision in 2019. So that's the edition to get. It's a real eye-opener. Anti-Semitism in Church History, How the Church Departed from Its Jewish Roots. So uh, let Gentile Christians read that and weep and understand what's happened. So from the very other perspective, start there. Our hands are stained with blood. And, okay. and we'll lay out Jewish roots of the faith, etc. And I'll put links to these below, by the way. Then there's another book called 60 Questions Christians Ask About Jewish Beliefs and Practices. 60 Questions Christians ask about Jewish beliefs and practices. And that book will, it answers all kinds of questions, but the last quarter of it just deals with Christians and the law. So a lot of okay. practical reflections, the dietary laws, the biblical calendar, the Sabbath, a lot of practical reflections there. Uh, so that'll help in terms of many that, that you deal with and interact with. Uh, those interacting more with the Jewish community and apologetics, my five volumes on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, and volumes four and five would be the most relevant. Okay. Objections based on the New Testament. And that's where we get into believers in the law. And then the place of rabbinic tradition in the fifth volume. And, and anyone can get a summary of, of the key issues if they go to realmessiah.com, realmessiah.com. Okay. And they'll see full-length debates I've done with rabbis. My, my old debate on, on audio there with Rabbi Singer is up there. By the way, it was, it was videotaped by Christian Broadcasting. They were going to air the entire debate on CBN, which would have been amazing. So Toby, the camera crew came in. Uh, he was given the form to sign. He goes, I'll sign it afterwards, you know, permission. And he, he never granted permission. Otherwise, this the whole that ended up on a cassette? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that also would have been video, video. It was videotaped, but he refused to give permission for that to get out. Just fact. God knows. I, I, I've heard it. that debate. I didn't know that story behind it. Yeah. So realmessiah.com, if they just look at answering objections, and then it's broken down into general, historical, theological, messianic prophecy, New Testament, and traditional. And it's all free. Everything on the website is free. Uh, I also got answering the rabbis there, demolishing a lot of Toby's videos we got probably our first 11, 12 up, and we keep producing more. So realmessiah.com is a great place to go. Uh, watch debates with rabbis, find out more about presenting Yeshua as the Messiah. And then look at some of the issues that we tackle in volumes four and five that we have summarized on the website there. Uh, those would all be helpful, I believe. And the larger issues of um, Hebrew Israelite and where this intersects, which people find interesting, uh, askdrbrown.org. They just search or get the app. In fact, you just get the app, Ask Dr. Brown, ASK Dear Brown Ministries. You'll find Real Messiah on there, links to all of our 3,000 plus YouTube videos and 3,000 plus articles, uh, all there freely linked on Ask Dr. Brown Ministries. Awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you. You are a blessing to the kingdom. Well, my joy, my joy. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Atah Haish, did I get that right? You are the man. Yeah. Good hearing there. Thank you. <laughs> As David once heard. But no, I really appreciate all the, all the work that you do. And I especially appreciate your heart uh, for people. You're not combative and mean and, and you know, divisive. What you're, what, it's so clear in what you're doing that you're, you're preaching love and you're preaching unity. And I love that. Well, that listen, the Lord's very kind and gracious to me and very patient with me. And we're all growing. We're all on a journey. If we can just major on the majors, we'll be great. And I know the Ataha Ish in Second Samuel 12 is very different yes. than, than yours here. So we're good on that. <laughs> okay. God bless. And thanks. Thanks for all the good work you're doing. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.